Here today I'm present to you uh, my joint work with Stefan Jambowski and Sebastian Faust and our work is on general state channel networks. So as you have heard uh, several times today, uh, the common problem of uh, cryptocurrencies is that they don't scale we very well. And why is this? Every transaction that is posted to the blockchain has to be stored in so-called a block. And if we take as an example the Bitcoin blockchain, a new block appears roughly in 10 minutes and the block size is limited to uh, one megabyte. And this imposes a maximum throughput that the system is able to handle. So if we take the Bitcoin, then it's roughly seven transactions per second. Other cryptocurrencies have a little bit different parameters, but anyway. The throughput is not sufficient if we want to use the system in large scale. So from the user's point of view, it's simply way too slow and quite expensive. So one way how to tackle this problem is to use off-chain techniques. And the goal of off-chain techniques is to achieve instantaneous transaction processing by not posting every transaction on the blockchain, but let parties execute some protocol between each other and then post some small amount of information to the blockchain, some information about their trading. And very important is that we don't want to make any additional assumption, trust assumption. We don't want to assume that parties all of a sudden start trusting each other or that there's some third party that they can trust. So the only uh, only trust comes from the blockchain itself. So a very important example of off-chain techniques are so-called payment channel. So let me explain it on the following example. Let's assume we have Alice and Bob and they want to exchange many transactions. So first of all, they put on a blockchain so-called funding transaction saying, okay, we want to trade with each other and initially Ellie's balance is five coins and Bob's balance is two coins, for example. And then they can exchange many off-chain payments. So first Ellie pays Bob and then Bob pay pays something back. In fact, we don't care how many of these payments they actually perform. And once they are done, they can go back to the blockchain and say, okay, so we are done with our payments. This is the final balance. And for example, Bob has all the coins and Ellie has nothing. So this is very nice because no matter how many payments they perform off the chain, there are only two transactions on the blockchain. And uh, these payment system already exist. They exist even in practice, for example, the Lightning Network. Uh, however, they cover only payments. And as we have heard uh, today and yesterday as well, payments are not the only thing that we can do over the blockchain. In particular, we can do more using smart contracts. So I don't want to dive into too many details what a smart contract is, but you can think of a small program running on the blockchain, which can be executed or run or triggered by a transaction that is posted on the blockchain. So for example, Alice and Bob can play some game, say chess, and say, okay, the winner will get one coin from the loser. This is something that we can implement using smart contracts. However, if they really want to play chess over the blockchain, they need to post many transactions. And as I said at the beginning, since posting on the blockchain takes quite long and it's quite expensive, probably they don't really want to do this. So obvious question is, can we do this off chain? Can we take smart contracts off chain? And this is exactly what motivated our work. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So our first contribution are so-called ledger state channels. So assume again the scenario where we have Alice and Bob and they first agree on a special contract which we call channel contract where they say, okay, we want to run some application, some game off the chain. So by posting this, this smart contract, deploying the smart contract on a blockchain, they create a state channel. We call it a ledger state channel. And now they can start playing their game. They can play chess and execute off the chain. In fact, they don't have to play only one game. They can play multiple games in a row. Uh, let's see, okay. Multiple games in a row. They can uh, play also lottery or, or another chess game, etc. And once they are done playing, they go back to the blockchain and they close their channel. 
Okay, so now assume the scenario that we have Alice, Ingrid, and Bob, and we already have two existing ledger state channels. Okay, so Alice has a ledger state channel with Ingrid, and Bob has a ledger state channel with Ingrid. So if now Alice and Bob want to play together, well, they can create another ledger state channel. However, this is quite slow and expensive because, again, they have to deploy a contract on a blockchain. So can't we actually use the existing ledger state channels? They are state channels, right? We can open some smart contract in them. And this is exactly what we do and create so-called virtual, virtual state channels. Why virtual? Well, because from the point of view of blockchain, they don't exist. There is no smart contract backing them up. We use only the ledger state channels for this. OK, so now we have a virtual state channel. So this is a state channel. Can't we use this same argument again? Can't we take two virtual state channels and build another virtual channel on top of it? And this is exactly what we do. And using this principle, we achieve virtual state channels of arbitrary length. OK, so uh, this summarized our contribution, our paper. And for the rest of the talk, I would like to uh, say a few words about our construction, a little bit more details about how we actually construct ledger state channels and how we construct virtual state channels. So let me start with ledger state channels. So first of all, what should be the functionality? What do we want to achieve? So we sh two parties should be able to create such a ledger channel. They should be able to start a game, so add a new contract. They should be able to play, so execute a contract. And when they are done, they should be able to close it. And what's very important is that adding a contract and executing a contract should happen completely off the chain if both parties are honest. So we call this the optimistic case. So how do we add a new contract and how do we execute it? Let me dive into more details. So suppose that Alice proposes to play the chess game. She locally prepares the initial settings of the game. So she says, OK, Bob, we're going to play chess. These are the rules. Let's assume that each of us bets initially one coin. She sends her signature on this initial setup. We call it the version one of the chess game to Bob. And if Bob agrees, he sends his signature back. So pretty simple. And as you can see now, each of the party has one coin less available in the channel because it's locked in the chess game. So they can continue playing their chess game by exchanging signature on the new version of the game. This is very nice. This, If both parties are honest, they can exchange signature, fine. But what happens if one party is malicious? What happens if there is the last move of the game and now the other party stops reacting? So assume that Alice has the last move. She will win the game. And now Bob says, OK, I don't agree. I actually don't want to lose. So I'm not signing back. Now, of course, in our system, we want to allow Alice to finish the game, right? Because otherwise, this is so obvious, attack Bob can always run. So in this case, Alice has to go back to the blockchain. So first of all, the contract on the blockchain does not know that parties were r running any chess game. So first of all, they have to tell, look, we were playing a chess game, and this was the last state we agreed on. So this is exactly what Alice does. She submits the last version she has from Bob. Bob has some time to react, but here on this example, we assume that he tries to cheat and revert the entire game. The smart contract on the blockchain now compares the two versions and says, OK, Alice has the latest valid version, so I register the Alice's version. And now finally, Alice can finish playing the game. She can continue executing via the blockchain. So the important message here is if parties are honest, so in the optimistic case, we run completely off the chain. However, if there is some malicious party or some disagreement, we go back on chain and resolve the dispute and continue playing on the chain. OK, so let me move on to virtual state channels. 
Okay, here we are. Uh, so again, the functionality is very similar as for ledger state channel. Again, we want to be able to create such a channel. We want to add a new contract, execute and close. The main difference is that now all four of these steps have to happen off the chain in the optimistic case. So if all the three parties involved are honest, we want to run off the chain. So let me just recall the motivation for virtual state channels. So we said we don't want to have a new smart contract on a blockchain because of virtual channel, because it's slow and expensive, etc. So the first idea might be, OK, so well, wh why did we actually need the smart contract in the ledger case? Well, we need it as a sort of a judge, right? If Alice and Bob disagree, they could always go back to the ledger and decide, OK, who is right, and they could continue playing. So who's going to play the role of this judge? Well, we could ask Ingrid to play the role of the judge. However, what if she is malicious, right? What, what, what if she's not available all the time? She might be offline, or she might even collude with the other party. So we also don't want to use Ingrid. So instead, as I already hinted at the very beginning of my talk, we use the power of the ledger state channels. OK, so in more detail, what do we actually do? In each of these ledger state channels, we add a new contract, in particular, a virtual channel contract. And you can intuitively think of this contract being sort of a copy of the virtual channel. And this co in this copy, in one of them, Ingrid plays the role of Bob, or on the other side, Ingrid plays the role of Alice. OK, so this is exactly how we create virtual state channels. And this idea can be also extended if we create longer channels. So for example, here we already have one virtual state channel, this green channel you can see between Alice and Bob. And so now we add a new contract in this channel, and we create a channel between uh, Alice and Charlie. OK, so having a contract, uh, having a channel between Alice and Charlie, they can again start playing some game. And they play it exactly the same way as if it would be a ledger state channel. So they just exchange signatures on version of the game. They don't have to talk to the blockchain. They don't have to talk to any other party, not Ingrid, not Bob, no one. OK, so this is the optimistic case. But what happens if one of the parties disagree? OK, so what happens in case of a dispute? So assume that Charlie is malicious, and he again, for example, does not confirm the last move. Then in this case, Alice go to Bob. He, she goes to the subchannels, to the underlying channels, and tries to resolve the dispute on this level. If Bob is honest, Everything will be resolved here without touching the blockchain, without talking to Ingrid, just on this level. However, if Bob is malicious, well, then there is a dispute between Alice and Bob. And in this case, Alice has to go to Ingrid. So again, if Ingrid is honest, the dispute will be resolved on this level. We don't have to do anything else. However, if also Ingrid is malicious, well, then Alice has to go to the blockchain. So the important message here is only in the very worst case where Charlie and Bob and Ingrid are malicious, only then Alice is actually forced to contact blockchain. Otherwise, even disputes can be handled off the chain. OK, let's wait. Ah, We are back. OK, so. Um, I don't have enough time to explain details of our construction, uh, but I would like to point out a few uh, challenges that we had to face uh, when we were designing the protocol. So first of all, if the dispute process is implemented naively or designed naively, as I described it before, uh, it's not so difficult to see that we achieve exponential time complexity in the channel length. And this is not what we want. So our goal was to uh, reduce this time complexity. And in the paper, you can find the protocol that achieves time complexity, which is linear in the channel length. Uh, another challenge is that we don't want to impose any restrictions on the contracts that we can open in our channels. In particular, if you take the chess game, it's always clear who 
stern it is. So it should be Alice, then Bob, then Alice, then Bob. Good, there is a fixed order. But in general, we want to allow parallel executions. We don't want to put any restrictions, which of course imposes another technical challenge. And uh, another important thing that I would like to stress that we always have to guarantee that if the intermediary of the channel, so Ingrid in this case, uh, behaves honestly and follows our protocol, she will never lose money. Somewhat intuitively, you can could al already see it maybe at the beginning when I said that Alice, uh, that Ingrid plays the role of Alice on one side and plays the role of Bob on the other side. So intuitively, if Ingrid loses on one side, she will get the money back from the other side. However, in the protocol, we have to be very careful with this because Ingrid has to always have enough time to mimic whatever happens on one side, mimic it to the other side. Okay. Because, well, only then she can actually keep things synchronized. She has the guarantee that she actually uh, gets what is she is supposed to get. Okay, and the rest of the talk, I would like to very briefly explain how do we actually prove our constructions? How, how do we even model our, our work? So we use the universal composability model of Rankin Eddy. Uh, so maybe many of you are familiar with it, maybe someone not. So let me very briefly explain. So as a first step, we formally define what channels of length up to i, how they should actually behave or what is their functionality. So we call this uh, ideal functionality. and. Uh, Maybe you already can uh, foresee it. It has four steps, this create, add, execute, and close. So this is our ideal functionality. And our second step is to design a protocol, which is run between parties. The parties can use the channel smart contract on the blockchain, but otherwise they just execute some protocol between each other. And as a third step, we show that this protocol actually emulates the ideal functionality. Okay, so uh, briefly, how does this work? Recall that our design of our protocol was modular, right? So we took two ledger state channels and built a virtual channel on top of it. And then we took a virtual channel and a ledger channel and built a longer virtual channel. So our modeling approach and our proof is modular as well. So as a first step, there we go. As a first step, we, uh, we prove so-called virtual channel theorem, which tells us that if we assume channels of length i minus 1, we can build channels of length i. And this brings us all the way down to ledger state channels. OK, so the virtual uh, channel theorem brought us all the way down to ledger channels. And now we can use the beauty and the power of the universal composability and compose all these protocols. OK, so now we have, by composing these small protocols, we get one big protocol which uses ledger state channels. So as a third step, we prove a theorem how to actually construct ledger state channels. And we again use the composition theorem. And as you can see in this modular way, we prove that our ideal functionality for channels of length up to i, we have a protocol for it, uh, which uses uh, the smart contract on the blockchain, the channel smart contract on the blockchain. OK, so let me conclude my talk. I was telling you about how to take smart contracts off the chain, in particular, how to design ledger state channels. Secondly, I was saying how we can extend this to design virtual state channels of arbitrary length. I was telling you about some challenges we had to face and that our protocol achieves linear time complexity for the dispute linear in the channel length. And finally, very briefly, I explained uh, how we prove security in the UC model. More details can be found in our paper. And this is everything from me. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to answer questions if you have. Uh, so great presentation. Um, my question is, in case of a dispute between Alice and Bob, 
what is the inset incentive of Ingrid to actually solve the dispute? Because Ingrid, uh, she could say, I don't really care. This is not my problem. And she don't want to spend her time computing things for other people, especially if there's no incentive. Like in the blockchain, you have miners, but the miners get fees, but there's no fees here. Yeah, so, so in practice, okay, okay so uh, our work at the moment is fairly theoretical. In practice, you would have fees for uh, for Ingrid. So Ingrid would ha get some small fee for her service. These fees should be always lower than the blockchain fees that would be required. However, there, there is still, once Ingrid actually agrees to uh, be the intermediary of the channel, she actually has an incentive to resolve the dispute because, I mean, she can say I'm offline. But at that point, Alice and Ingrid run into dispute, in which case Alice goes to the blockchain. And uh, so if Ingrid doesn't react to this blockchain interaction, she will actually lose coins. So once Ingrid agrees of being an intermediary, she is incentivized to uh, resolve disputes. Okay, but she can refuse. She yeah, can yeah. Say, I don't agree, and then exactly. I mean, uh, in the worst case, we can always go to. We have to go to the blockchain and resolve it on the blockchain. In the worst case, yes. Okay, thank you. Hi, great work. Can you go by several slides to say what Alice dispu have a distribution with Chase? Yeah. Okay. This yeah. one. Yes, yes, yes. So what if when Alice has a dispute with Charles and Alice is the malicious, malicious party, he goes to resolve the dispute with Bob and Bob is a malicious, what will happen? Yeah, then, then you go to the blockchain immediately. I mean, if Alice and Bob are malicious, they are trying to resolve a so-called dispute. They well, may, they yeah. may fool Charles, right? So, so from Charlie's point mm -hmm. of view, yes. Uh, he first cares about Alice, right? And if Alice is misbehaves, mm -hmm. Charlie goes to Bob. If Bob misbehaves, well, then Charlie goes to the blockchain. So, so and mm -hmm. Charlie doesn't re really care how Bob and Alice resolve the dispute between each other. It's be between these two parties. Somehow, Charlie only cares about the part that relates to him immediately, which means the channel between Bob and Charlie. Okay. She yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, great talk. <laughs> yeah. uh, I just wondering that from your talk, your the example only support two participants. I just want to want to know uh, is that possible? The smart contract in this system supports multiple uh, participants. And uh, no, this is uh, an extension to our work that can be of course yeah. done, but at the moment we support only two parties. Okay, thank you. Oh, just, just one yeah, quick yeah. So I, I think the longer the chain, the more robust uh, will be the communication between the two parties, right? So in what sense you the, mean robust? The, the virtual robust, the, the, the less likely that there is will be one malicious. If, if one malicious, the whole thing will uh, will fail. Is this right? Is it, no, I mean, if Alice and Charlie going to the blockchain, if you want to resolve it in the virtual in the virtual channel. So, I mean, it, it, as long as Alice and Charlie are honest, they don't really care if one of the intermediaries is corrupt because they don't need to contact them at all. So mm. if I, I decide to play with my friend, then I trust my friend, and we are honest, and everything goes on well. Mm -hmm. Only when we start dis like Dispute. disputing. L this this is some, there's a dispute here. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so the longer the chain, uh, the better. Is this correct? The longer the well. The, the okay. Virtual, yeah. Yeah. The virtual channel. In in, yeah. in, in some sense, yes, because yeah. you can think of it as layers of defense, correct. right? Correct. Because That's you exactly, go exactly. exactly. Yes. Exactly. So yes. In, th in this case, have you thought about the, what's the uh, optimal length or this is left to the to the user to define or yes i think that this uh, there are actually many things many aspects that has to be into consideration it's not in our work okay. but uh, it also depends what sort of contract you actually want to play for how many of them mm -hmm. uh, how much communication will there be how expensive would it be for you to actually go and dispute on the blockchain exactly. so there are many exactly. parameters and we did not analyze okay. it in the Sounds paper good. thank you thank you Let's the speaker again.